Welcome to Are We There Yet? I'm Katie Gossett. And when we enter the world as babies, our first relationships are with our parents, and then we slowly start to gravitate towards others. For shy children, kindergartens are a good preparation too for the break between home and the strangeness of primary school, and boys and girls come into contact with others their own age. See, I love that expression, the strangeness of primary school, because it can be a really weird place, not that I exactly remember. But then the thing of trying to connect with new people and make friends, it's not always that easy. Initially, when he first started school, he was just overwhelmed by the number of kids there, and he got so frightened when he was a new entrance that he vomited, that he just got himself so stewed up. If she's invited to something, she goes into a total panic because she knows she's going to have to deal with a crowd of people. So then I get tears and anxiety and panic attacks that are quite severe sometimes. So if you heard our last episode, it was all about anxiety and alarms. So the idea that we all have a kind of internal alarm system, basically a primal reaction that makes us freeze, fight or take flight, and it kicks in when we're in danger. But for some people, and some children who are anxious, the alarm can trick their brains, so they feel like they're in danger when they're not. Her body will shake, and she actually said to me that she sometimes feels like she almost leaves her body. So we're going to keep looking at anxiety and how it affects our interactions with others. And as this panel discussion from back in 1976 shows, parents have always worried about their children's social skills. Do you think we make a bit of a fuss about getting our children to learn to live with others? Absolutely not. I mean, I think uh, learning to live with others is the most vital thing. It's what life's all about, getting on with others, communicating with others. But what if your child finds that really hard? And when does the way they feel turn into social anxiety? Social anxiety is when we fear criticism or rejection from others. Underlying it are often fears that something is wrong with us or we will do something wrong, such as make a mistake, go red in the face or perform poorly. So here's our clinical psychologist, Catherine Gallagher, on the social side of anxiety and why perfectionism is often at the root of the problem. Our worry brains can tell us that we need to be perfect or flawless or, to the other extreme, we're destined for an epic YouTube-worthy fail and there's no in-between. So anxious brains are often black and white brains. We're either on fire or it's a complete disaster. And that means the old alarm system we've been talking about is primed and ready to go before we or our children even go into a situation. So if we're thinking about things like no one's going to talk to me or they'll think I'm boring or what if I say the wrong things or what if I trip up. So not surprisingly, these worries that are in our brains and are setting off our alarm system before we even get into the anxiety-provoking situation are going to affect our behaviour. So we can seem less engaged, look awkward, or be over the top as we try to cover our anxiety. Many boys and girls are shy and nervous. They appear to be dull, but they're often only uncertain and confused. And so it ends up being a self-fulfilling prophecy. Anxiety comes because we're worried about what's going to happen. It then can affect our behaviour, which means then we don't expose ourselves to social situations where we would actually build up skills and confidence to manage those situations better. And then if your child doesn't go to the party, or whatever it is, they worry that they won't get another chance. If she gets invited to something, she makes up an excuse and then she gets upset that they're going to start not liking her. And she worries too because often people see her as being rude. And it's not that, it's just that when somebody is trying to talk to her, she actually really struggles to talk back to them. And when I put this scenario to Catherine Gallagher... That's a lovely example of anxiety. You're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. When we think about the power of our worry thoughts, they're actually really hard on us. You know, they often will set ourselves up to fail. And even if we don't fail, they often will pick away at us to kind of go, well, are you sure? Are you sure that didn't happen? Are you sure that's not what people are going to be thinking? And once you're caught up in the post-mortem, you tend to only remember the bad stuff. It's often focusing in on, well, that sounded stupid, or gosh, that person wasn't even looking at me. Which again, if you can imagine, makes our alarm system sensitised, and our memory of that situation gets tainted, gets coloured with that. 
So while a socially anxious person might tend to worry about that anxiety and fret about how it's coming across to others, often other people don't even notice. And that's partly down to us as parents because we step in and rescue our children from awkward situations. So when they hit the first roadblock, it's like, whoa, can't cope with this because their alarm system's going off like crazy and they haven't got enough experience of getting over that hump of getting through that situation to the other side to know that, yeah, it got pretty hairy for a while there, but I got through and I'm okay. As little ones are led unaware toward new experiences, they slowly forget their shyness. So shy children are often cautious, emotionally sensitive and slow to warm up in social situations. Of course, shy people can go on to develop socially anxious thoughts especially if they get into a pattern of avoidance and don't develop the skills and confidence to manage themselves in social situations. Even if they do develop social skills, they might always be a little bit uncomfortable going into a party where they might know some people and not others because temperamentally they kind of warm up to, oh gosh, what's going to happen here? But certainly shyness doesn't mean they're going to avoid that situation and shyness can be worked around and skills and confidence can be built up around shyness. And then there's introversion, which is different again, because introversion tends to be about a preference, rather than being driven by fear. Often socially anxious people may really want to be social and have lots of friends, but find it very difficult to do so. Whereas an introvert probably has a preference for being in their own company, or is quite contented reading a book and just not having friends over after school, because in fact the social content at school might have actually just been enough for them, thank you very much. That's not a problem necessarily. You know, so sometimes it's about getting that balance right and knowing your child's temperament. So, if you've established that it's not about temperament and your child is socially anxious, then what to do? If it's serious and severe, then you should get professional help. But one thing you can do as a parent is to help your child confront their fears, and it starts with validating how hard it is for them. When their alarm's going off, it feels like a life and death situation. So, the feeling is real. Yeah, it feels dangerous. The challenge is that the situation is not dangerous. And that's the bit the child has to work through with support from mum and dad. So that support might involve encouraging your child to do something you know they find scary. But at the same time, you need to be realistic about the fact that it is scary for them and it might take a while before it works. Because if my expectation is, or mum or dad's expectation, is I should be able to go into the situation and be awesomely comfortable, that might not be the case. (laughs) And so when I feel uncomfortable, it's like, oh, here it is, it's turning up again, this one anxiety, I'm not going to like it, it's not going to be good. So you can see how this the problem snowballs, whereas if the expectation is that, guess what, I don't necessarily love these situations, I find them quite difficult. And if that's validated, like, yeah, this stuff is tough, hey, what are we going to do about it? So we actually expect anxiety to turn up, we come up with a plan for it. So the child goes into that situation much more realistically prepared for it, and typically is going to manage it a lot better. And then you as a parent need to work out what's the best way to get your child involved in an activity, and it might be that it's something with adult supervision. So an adult can kind of get involved and help facilitate what's going on. Your child might be great as a library help, because they've got a job to do, as opposed to just the expectation that they can be able to join into a game, because that's quite a tough thing to do. But it's important that your children don't avoid things that stress them out. So these are not the kids who you're letting stay home with sore tummies. You know, you're you're supporting them to be at school even if it's through tears and distress. And she says don't spend too long talking about it at the end of the day either. Because again, yes, there might have been tough times, but there might also have been some brave times. And limit the time spent talking about worries. For example, only allow so many worry questions a day or set aside a short worry time to discuss issues um, so it doesn't leak into every moment. And certainly please make sure that the worry time is not set aside at bedtime. And the more they tackle their anxiety, the better they get at working out if it's just a worry or something more serious. Because if it's a problem, then absolutely, we're coming in there all guns blazing. You know, if it's bullying, then you're supporting your child around how to manage that. But if what comes out is, well, what if that happens, mum? Then a pretty good clue that it's a worry question is it starts with what if. So you're starting to school your child up to distinguish what might be a problem that we can actually work together to fix or what is something that is just their brain tricking them. And while they're feeling like that, while they're worrying, that's the time to take action. They need to do life, do these things while anxious. They actually have to feel it and calm down while doing the anxious thing 
so that the brain and them learn that they can do it. And along the way, it never hurts to have empathy for others, whose reasons for being quiet and apparently shy might not be what you think. People do think that people that don't chat to them freely or whatever are a bit rude, but it's not always the case. It's just that they're not really knowing what to say. And that's it from us. This podcast was made by me, Katie Gossett. Adam McCauley helps with the lovely musical Trilly Bits, and Tim Watkin is the executive producer. The nice historic audio comes from Ngā Taonga Sound and Vision and Archives New Zealand. You can find and subscribe to more episodes on Apple Podcasts or have a look at the podcast page at rnz.co.nz where you'll see some other great offerings including Black Sheep, a casting call of some of New Zealand's most villainous knaves and navesses. And listen out for our next episode when I'll look at toilet training and bedwetting.